put your hand up if you've ever applied for a job. All right. Keep your hand up if you've ever applied for the role of a servant. Okay. What's something they usually ask for when you apply for a job? CV. CV. Previous experience. experience. Qualifications. Qualifications. Okay. (laughs) Qualifications. Today, we're looking at the qualifications needed to be a servant. So, what is a servant? According to the Oxford Dictionary, a servant is a person who performs duties for others, especially a person employed in a house on domestic duties or as a personal attendant. Today, we'll be looking at what the Bible says about servants in the church. We're about halfway through Paul's letter. Paul's first letter to Timothy in our Faith and Truth series. And Paul was writing to instruct his younger co-laborer, Timothy, on how to establish and support the church in Ephesus in the midst of Satan's attempts to tear it down through false teachers sowing seeds of confusion and disunity. One of the ways Paul was instructing to establish the church was through appointing qualified leaders within the church in the form of overseers, otherwise known as pastors or elders, and also deacons, otherwise known as servants. Last week, Adam beautifully led us through the section on overseers, And today, I have the privilege of leading us through this section on deacons. So, let's get straight into it. So, verse 8 starts, deacons. The verse literally starts with the word which the rest of the passage is built around. The word in Greek is diakonos which simply means servant. Strong's Bible concordance describes it as one who executes the commands of another. Various people are called servants throughout the New Testament scriptures, both male and female. There are many ways to be a servant, but the use of servant in today's passage, is different to much of its use elsewhere. Here we see Paul clearly speaking about a particular office within the church, a ministry which isn't available to just anyone, not even to any Christian. This type of servant role is only available to those who meet a specific set of qualifications. This is partly why Bibles often transliterate the word as deacons instead of simply translating it directly as servants to make clear that this is an official position within the church, a particular designation reserved For those qualified, unlike the more general servanthood of other church members. When it comes to official church deacons, this is one of the only Bible passages which we can be certain is explicitly referencing them directly. So, in many ways, we have very little to go on. This means we need to be 
particularly scrupulous when analysing what he does and doesn't say. By no means think that this sermon is going to cover all there is to say on the topic. Spend time in community groups or in your own personal time, combing through the text and reflecting on what you find in light of the whole counsel of Scripture. Also, since what we have to base our views on is so minimal, rather than trying to be dogmatic, we should be even more gracious than usual to those who might view deacons differently than we do and really try to hear what other people have to say on the matter. It's quite clear that deacons help the church through acts of service. That's one thing we know for sure. While overseers focus on prayer and preaching, deacons focus on what some might call the more practical side of things. Based on what we see in Scripture, in addition to the historical records we have of the early church, it seems the role of deacons was generally expected to revolve around things like waiting tables, taking responsibility for the church finances, looking after the sick, visiting church members in prison, caring for widows and orphans, feeding and clothing the poor, and generally dealing with people's outward physical needs. Deacons played a huge role in tackling social justice issues. And many noteworthy deacons were heavily involved in the eventual abolition of slavery in the 1800s. Many people look to Acts 6 as the prototype for the role of deacons within the church. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, so much can be said about this passage, but I just want to look at a few key points before we move on. There was grief within the church. A cultural and ethnic divide was being exposed due to partiality being shown toward Hebrew Jews to the neglect of the Greek Hellenistic Jews. So the apostles who were operating in overseer-type roles 
instructed the church to select servants to deal with these social justice type issues so that those overseeing could focus on prayer and preaching instead. They told them to choose men and gave a short list of qualifications. Interestingly, all the men chosen by the church had Greek names, so feel free to speculate in your community groups on why that might have been. But when the complaint about the widows came to the apostles, they could have said, okay, thanks for letting us know. We'll drop everything we're doing and deal with this now instead. Forget the prayer meeting and the Bible study, no time for that anymore. We're changing the name of our church to Greek Widows Church. We'll stop preaching on Sundays and we'll just go out to the community raising money for these widows instead. That's our new priority. But they didn't do that, did they? They also could have said, why are you telling us about these Greek widows? What's that got to do with preaching the gospel? We're preaching Christ crucified. People are getting saved, can't you see? We're praying and we're preaching the Bible. Stop distracting us with these unimportant issues. Stop moaning and complaining about your personal issues that you care about. Can't you see that we're focused on the things that matter? The eternal things. Don't you remember? Jesus said the poor will always be with you. He didn't come to sort out social justice issues. He came to save us from our sin. But they didn't say that either, did they? Instead, they found a way to appropriately deal with the issue without it getting in the way of what they personally needed to prioritize. And they did that by what would be their early equivalent of appointing deacons. Pastor, author, editor, and former deacon, Matt Smethurst, has something interesting to say about how this applies to modern churches in his book, Deacons, How They Serve and Strengthen the Church. He says, I sometimes perceive an ironic similarity between churches who want to just preach the gospel and those who want to transform the culture. The one tends to oppose social ministry in favor of gospel proclamation. The other tends to champion social ministry instead of gospel proclamation. Yet both are susceptible to an impoverished view of the diaconate, meaning the ministry of the deacons. In just preach the gospel churches, diaconal mercy ministry can be seen as unimportant. In transform the culture churches, diaconal mercy ministry can be seen as superfluous and unnecessary. For it's what the whole congregation exists to do already. In the former the mission of the church manages to downplay this diaconal role. In the latter, this calling of deacons becomes the mission of the church. Thus, it is crucial in healthy churches, rightly committed to preaching Christ and making disciples, that we not diminish the diaconate. God's social office for catalyzing spiritual mission Yes, it is true that the gospel would not have spread in Acts 6 had the apostles neglected their chief calling to preach and pray. But it's also true that the gospel likely would not have spread had the seven not risen to meet the widow's needs. 
Perhaps today's highly charged conversations about the church's mission would move forward if we had some of these historical ecclesial categories more firmly in place. As we've seen, a holistic ministry that weds these concerns, gospel proclamation and gospel demonstration, is not the latest fad. It has been par for the course throughout church history. Deed ministry, diaconal, has always served word ministry, pastoral. What God has joined together, let no church separate. So, the work of the men in Acts 6 helped maintain God glorifying unity within the church. They helped uphold love among believers, which ultimately helps outsiders to see the power of the gospel at work within the church. No doubt this contributed to the multiplication of disciples we're informed of in verse 7 at the end of that passage. Deacons have a huge opportunity to help with the task of preserving unity within the church. Matt Smithhurst's book on deacons has an entire chapter devoted to telling true stories about how the amazing work of deacons within the church goes on, within churches of people who he's friends with. And I look forward to going through some of those stories with my community group this week. So many of those testimonies are about how deacons were used by God to prevent division within the churches. A great quality to look for in a deacon is that of a peacemaker. Someone who not only doesn't cause problems, but sees them and doesn't add to them, but finds a way to silently solve them. In Matthew 5, 9, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Note that it says peacemakers, not peacekeepers. It's not just a matter of staying out of trouble. It's being someone who can step in where trouble has occurred and make peace. Deacons should sense and meet people's tangible needs. Deacons shouldn't need to be babysat by overseers. They should be able to fulfill their roles without slacking off, but should also be able to recruit others and delegate tasks in such a way as to not overwork themselves. Deacons shouldn't need overseers to be telling them what needs to be done. They should be able to find out what the issues are and deal with them before these things are even able to reach the overseers. But these are all just practical requirements of the role. What are the specific biblical qualifications? Well, let's go back to verse 8 of today's text. It says, deacons, likewise. So, Paul is following on from what we saw last week, where he gave the qualifications for overseers. And now he's saying deacons, likewise, must be qualified. Just like we won't let any random person get up and preach on Sunday as an overseer of the church, we also would not let anyone just decide that they're the new church deacon. No. Just like overseers must have their character and life assessed in accordance with a list of qualifications, so must deacons. We see that the list has a ton of similarities to the list for overseers. So deacons must be qualified likewise. A deacon must be dignified. In 1 Timothy 3, verse 4, we see that an overseer must manage their household well with all dignity. A deacon must not be double-tongued. 
in chapter 3, verse 3, we see that an overseer must not be quarrelsome. So there's a connection there. In verse 2, we see that an overseer must be sober-minded. And in verse 3, that an overseer must not be a drunkard. So then it's no surprise to see that a deacon must be not addicted to much wine. They also must not be greedy for dishonest gain. And we see in Titus 1 verse 7 that an elder must not be greedy for gain. An elder just being another word for overseer. In 1 Peter 5 2 also it says that an elder must not, not exercise their oversight for the sake of shameful gain. The parallels continue. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, it says, of the deacons. Obviously, for the overseers, it goes further and says that they must be able to teach. It says, of the deacons, let them also be tested first and let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. In verse 6, it said that an overseer must not be a recent convert. So clearly there's time allowed there for them to be tested. It says in verse 2 that an overseer must be above reproach. And that same word can be translated as blameless. Let deacons be the husband of one wife is mirrored in verse 2. An overseer must be the husband of one wife. Managing their children and their households well. In verse 4 and 5 we see that an overseer must manage his own household well. So many parallels, but the qualifications are not identical. The offices of overseer and deacon are not the same. And a deacon isn't on his way to becoming an overseer either. A deacon isn't a trainee overseer. A man could completely lack the ability to teach and therefore be unequipped to ever be an overseer. But meanwhile, that same man could be the best deacon on the entire planet. So a deacon doesn't need to meet the qualifications of an elder, of an overseer, but they do need to meet the qualifications of a deacon. Paul says, a deacon likewise must be. So these qualifications aren't optional there will be unavoidably negative consequences if an unqualified deacon is appointed. It'll turn out bad for the deacon, bad for the overseers, and bad for the whole church and its mission. So, let's have a look at what these qualifications are. Paul gives a few musts and a few must-nots. I won't touch on all of it in detail because I don't want to retread the ground that Adam covered last week. Hopefully, the combination of both messages should provide a decent idea of what all the qualifications are about. Today, we see Paul begins by insisting that deacons must be dignified. The King James Bible translates it as grave. The idea is that you treat things as weighty, as having gravity. You hear people sometimes say, you're not understanding the gravity of the situation. Deacons do understand the gravity of the situation. They take life seriously. Some scholars would say nobly serious, honourable, honest, venerable even, inspiring reverence and awe. A deacon shouldn't be a silly person, not someone that people take as a joke. A deacon may have to deal with some of people's most serious and personal issues. Who's going to want to go to a deacon that they think will just laugh and make a joke out of their suffering? The book of Ecclesiastes says that there's a time for everything. So there's certainly nothing wrong with a good laugh when the time's right. 
But Ecclesiastes 7, 2 to 6 says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of the face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Paul says, a deacon must be not double-tongued, not a gossip. Some scholars have speculated that maybe it's speaking of someone who gossips so much that it's like they've got two tongues. Others suggest it's more referring to the fact that a person's saying one thing to one person, but the opposite to someone else. We might call someone two-faced, where they might say double-tongued. A deacon might have to use discretion when dealing with interpersonal issues within the church, helping to solve disagreements and so on. This requires a man to have a degree of control over his tongue. James 3 from verse 5 says, The tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. A deacon can't be someone using their tongue to praise God on a Sunday morning, but then curse his brother on a Sunday evening. Paul goes on. A deacon must be not addicted to much wine. Wine is good. Jesus drank wine. Jesus turned water to wine. Jesus commanded us to drink wine in remembrance of his blood shed for us at the cross. Genesis 14, 18 says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. Isaiah 25, 6 says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And later in 1 Timothy 5, 23, we'll see that Paul tells Timothy, no longer drink only water, 
but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So wine is good. The Bible speaks well of it. But Proverbs 20 says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Isaiah 5.11 Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them. Verse 22 of Isaiah 5 says, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. Proverbs 23 from 29 to 35 goes on a little rant about the woes of drinking too much wine. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Wine is good. If you have a little of it with your meal and you're able to stop before the point where you start feeling tipsy. But 1 Corinthians 6.12 says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. 2 Peter 2.19 says, Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. If the sharpness of your mind is impeded due to your consumption of alcohol, or your consumption of anything for that matter, you've gone too far and you've had too much. If you're addicted to alcohol or anything, it needs to go. Deacons might have to go and buy the wine for communion or organize a party where there's going to be wine and people drinking. Back in Paul's day, they may have needed to bring wine to sick people to help them with the stomach issues, like Timothy. They didn't have the medicines and the readily available clean water that we have these days. But either way, if alcohol is something that you're still wrestling with, you're not ready to be a deacon. Paul says a deacon must be not greedy for dishonest gain. Deacons could be tasked with looking after the church funds and giving money to the poor. I've heard multiple stories of unqualified deacons with their hands in the offering box. Remember what we are told in John 12, that six days before the Passover, Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. That's not what we want our deacons to be like. Just like wine, money can be a good thing, but it can also enslave people and lead them astray. Luke 16, 9 says, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Money can help us even with spreading the gospel. But Luke 16, 13 says, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
So let's move on to verse 9 of today's text. Paul continues to explain about deacons, saying they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. We've spoken about mysteries before when we went through Ephesians and 1 Corinthians. When Paul speaks of mysteries, he doesn't mean secrets for you to try and figure out. He means things which were hidden in the Old Testament but have now been revealed in the New Testament. A mystery is a gospel truth that has been revealed. Paul here is talking about the entire gospel itself, the faith, the Christian faith, our entire set of core beliefs. Paul says deacons must hold them with a clear conscience. He already mentioned this concept to Timothy earlier in chapter 1, verse 5, where he said the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Then in verse 18 to 19, he said, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. So deacons aren't required to be able to teach the way that overseers are, but they're required to hold the faith with a good conscience, to have a strong grasp on what the Christian faith is all about. A deacon needs a solid understanding of Christian theology in order to serve the church and the lost in a biblical manner. Deacons are representing the church. They can't just be blagging it, doing loads of work without really knowing why or what it's all about. Some people set up this false idea that elders exclusively deal with all of the spiritual stuff in the church and then the deacons exclusively deal with all of the physical stuff in the church. So they don't need to know about spiritual stuff because they're just the deacons. But this isn't true. The role of deacon is a spiritual one. It requires faith. Having skills doesn't make you a good deacon. A deacon isn't a handyman for the church. Some people look at someone who's good with tools and can fix up the church building and assume that that person would make a good deacon. But the only B and Q that a deacon should care about are biblical qualifications. Some people look at someone who's rich and really good with the money and they think, yeah, that guy would be a good deacon. But we'll see later in chapter 6 that the only being rich that Paul cares about is being rich in good works, storing up treasures in heaven, guarding the deposit of the gospel, and setting our hopes on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Some will look at someone who's smart, who's good with computers or administration, and think they'd make a good deacon. But God has never been impressed by anyone's intellect, nor does he care how good you are with the internet. What matters is that your character matches with the qualifications listed in the text. Being a deacon does mean dealing with a lot of practical situations, but the main thing that matters in these situations is your character. The church building could collapse. We could run out of money. The website could crash. And our filing system could get all mixed up. But if we're all still holding the faith with clear consciences, then none of that other stuff matters. However, leaders falling due to more severe 
Moral failures, on the other hand, can completely devastate a church. So what matters is deacon's character. He says, and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons, if they prove themselves blameless. The Greek word translated as blameless here is very similar to the one translated as above reproach when Paul said the overseers must be above reproach. It would be acceptable to translate them both as blameless. Deacons can't be giving the church a bad reputation by being involved in countless scandals over their behavior in life. But of course, no one is perfect just as Adam spoke about last week. Pick your favorite popular preachers or evangelists who post videos on YouTube, and I'm fairly certain that every single one of them, I'd be able to go and find a comment, an article, a video, blaming them for something that they probably haven't even done. We're told that deacons should be blameless. But what does that mean? People will throw accusations at anyone. Anyone they don't like. But the idea of being blameless is that none of these are able to stick. A charge can't lay hold of them. There's that language in the original Greek that it's like the accusation is trying to grab hold of this person, but it's not able to. It's like trying to catch a cloud with your hands. Their wives, likewise. Okay. Wait, so Paul is now talking about the deacon's wives, is it? Well, according to the ESV, it seems that way. It says their wives, likewise. But most of us here, especially if you've been with us through 1 Corinthians, know that the word wives in the ancient Greek doesn't even exist in the first place. And it doesn't even say there in the original text. It simply reads, women, likewise. The ESV translators clearly think that these women are the deacon's wives, But how do we know who Paul is talking about here? It just says, women, likewise. So, which women? All the women in the church? Has Paul been talking about deacons, and now he just has got another thing he just wants to quickly say about all the women in the church? Or is it a particular group of women who are going to be helping the deacons in the work that they do? Is it the deacons' wives? Is it the elders and the deacons' wives that now he's talking to? Is it female deacons who he's now talking to? In Romans 16.1, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church. Some translations say a deacon of the church. So does that mean there are female deacons? We know that the word ultimately just means servant and the transliteration of it as deacon is really just done based on context to set it apart when we know that it's not talking about some other type of servant. But in this context, when Paul says it in Romans 16, how can we know? Is he saying a servant? Is he saying a deacon? She's clearly not a house servant or something, because it says servant of the church. But does he just mean a servant like any Christian would be classed as a servant of the church? Or does he mean a biblically qualified official deacon of the church? Throughout history, there have been many churches that have female deacons. And many churches that don't. Churches that think that Paul, in First Timothy is writing to deacons' wives and others that think he's writing to female deacons. I could go on for hours about the structure of the paragraph, the use of 
particular words in different contexts, the writing styles, translation biases of different Bible versions, cultural influences. Ultimately, what I do know is that Paul has decided to take a break from writing about the definitely male deacons that he was just writing about, and now he's opened up a female category of something for one verse, and then he immediately goes back to speaking about the definitely male deacons again. As a team of elders, as a team of overseers, pastors, none of us are convinced that Paul, in this verse, is setting up female deacons. In verse 11, I don't see enough to make that clear. But we're open to being shown evidence about that, if you think differently. What we do know is that he's definitely talking to women. So, women, listen up. He says, women, likewise, must be dignified. So, as above, grave, not silly. He says that they should be not slanderers. We can see similar things that he spoke about earlier, about being double-tongued. Some versions translate this as not false accusers. Women in the church should not be falsely accusing people. The word translated as slanderers or false accusers here is diabolos, which literally means devils. The women should not be devils. Hopefully that goes without saying. In Revelation 12, 7 to 11, it says, War arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. If you are falsely accusing your Christian brothers, you're doing the work of Satan. Paul says these women should be sober-minded, as above that they should be faithful in all things. We've seen above that the deacons should be blameless. A similar thing here, but more than that, not just avoiding doing wrong, which in a sense would make you blameless, but being faithful in all things means doing right in all areas. Then in verse 12, Paul clearly goes back to speaking to the deacons who are definitely men in those verses because he says in verse 12 let deacons each be the husband of one wife a one woman man is the literal phrase we looked at that last week with the overseers so I don't need to go into that too much but Basically, a man who hasn't been previously married, he's not got a, a, a harem, he's not, got a, uh, he's not polygamous, he's not committing adultery, he's not been married and remarried multiple times or anything like that. He's a man of one woman. Loyal, devoted, and so on. 
The deacons should be managing their children and their households well. Just like with the overseers, how can a deacon faithfully serve the church if he's not able to faithfully serve at home? House is a mess. Bills aren't getting paid on time. Wife's having a meltdown. Children are disobedient. This man should not be a deacon. This man should be discipled. If you're this man, find more experienced Christian men and ask how you can find ways to spend more regular time with them and learn from how they live. Learn from them. Finally, verse 13 says, For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves. Being a deacon is hard work. But if you serve as a deacon, Paul states two things that you'll receive. And the first is a good standing for yourself. The prayer and study of overseers is unseen and often overlooked. The work of deacons, however, is often more visible. They're serving in the church and it can help to earn respect for this good and faithful servant. An overseer must be well thought of in order to be qualified. But Paul promises that a deacon will be well thought of Some see the standing that it speaks of based on the language as a step towards eldership. I don't think any of us in leadership here see it as meaning that. But it is a step toward gaining respect within the church. And it might sound weird to say, but ultimately, how could it not be? What sort of person would you have to be to not give respect to someone who chooses to dedicate their life to serving your needs for the sake of your relationship with God. It's only logical that a person like that would gain respect within the church. You would have to be a strange sort of church to not respect your deacons. But still, some people will frown at this idea or think that it's wrong in some way for a deacon to be desiring respect from fellow Christians. And it certainly can be. If that's the reason you want to become a deacon is just to get respect from people, maybe that's wrong. But it depends why you're seeking that respect. There's nothing wrong with wanting to set a good example for others to follow. It's actually admirable to take on the responsibility of being a role model for others to look up to, to put yourself in a position where you'll be held accountable to live up to a certain standard with the aim of serving others and in turn winning their respect with the power of God on display as he humbles you as a servant, and uses you in your weakness to love people. And there's nothing wrong with being rewarded for your service. This good standing could also just be an internal thing, a sure-footedness, knowing that you're serving the children of God, you're serving God, that could provide internal confidence, which connects with what Paul goes on to say, as he says, that along with a good standing also comes great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Seeing God at work through your service will build your confidence in the faith. Being a servant brings you closer to Jesus Christ because Jesus is the ultimate servant. Being a servant is completely the opposite to what this world will teach you in life. People who don't know Jesus would hear a message like this 
and think, why on earth would I want to be involved in any of that? But Jesus flips the world upside down. The world says, be proud. Boast in your strength. Be a boss. Jesus Christ says, be humble. Boast in your weakness. Be a servant. In Luke 22, we see a dispute among the disciples where they're arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus said to them that the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. They're bossing them around. But he says, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus is obviously greater than all. But when he was at the table, he was there to serve. Mark goes on to add, whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus spoke these things as he was washing the feet of the disciples knowing that they would later abandon him, that Peter would deny him, that Judas would betray him. Jesus knew that he was about to be taken and tortured, murdered and crushed under the wrath of God. But despite knowing that that was imminently about to happen, he was thinking about serving the needs of his disciples, his disloyal disciples. He knew all that he was about to face and what he wanted to do at that time was to wash the disciples' feet. That is a true servant. In Philippians 2, it says to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests only, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, came to earth as the servant of servants. Those who put their faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as payment for their sin will receive eternal life. It's an amazing privilege to serve God. But first, you must let him serve you. Let Jesus Christ serve you today. Let his perfect life of obedience to God's law be for you. Let his suffering and agony dying on the cross be for you. Let him wash you 
with his precious blood that was spilt for you. Let his resurrection from the grave be for you. Allow his Holy Spirit to fill you today and take over your life. Let him forgive your sins. Remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh today. Let Jesus serve you. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He wants to serve you. Let him serve you. If you give up your old life and let him give you a new one, you'll no longer be condemned to hell. And instead, you'll get to spend eternity in the new Jerusalem with him. Revelation 22 says this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Bright as crystal. Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life. With its twelve kinds of fruit. Yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. So let's pray that we would be those servants. That one day we will see Jesus and he will say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant, and welcome us into his presence.